I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world, uncovering the tastes, traditions, and the recipes Look at that. of the world's best baking cities. I love coming into bakeries. From the historic streets of Palermo <laughs> to the multicultural city of San Francisco. Mm, I love it. Welcome to City Bakes. City Bakes has actually taken me to the furthest northern point I've ever been to on the planet, Reykjavik, Iceland. What awaits me is a landscape of volcanoes, snow and ice. What on earth can they grow to bake here? This is going to be absolutely fascinating. This time, baking like I've never experienced before. This is outside cooking on another scale. I meet Icelanders putting their spin on classic bakes. That is proper bread. And locals who bake without rules. If I do it like this, I get this. <laughs> I show you how to bake my Icelandic cake with yogurt right the way through the sponge. What we've got is something that's unique. And Vina Terta, my recipe of a traditional layered cake. There you have it, straight from Iceland. Welcome to City Bakes in Reykjavik. It's my first morning in Iceland's capital city. It's now 11 o'clock, quarter past 11 in the morning, and it's still dark. The sun's coming up but it's very, very slow. Only three hours, four hours of daylight here in the middle of winter. So it seems to be permanently in a twilight. Although Iceland is a huge island, its population is only 130,000 people. And nearly two thirds of those people live in or around Reykjavik. I'm here to explore the baking these Icelanders love. But first, I can't resist a little bit of sightseeing. How's about that for a church? Look at that. It's the tallest building in Reykjavik, and it's been built with concrete covering the outside to sort of look like cascading volcano. That is a cool church. And guess what? The best view of the city is right up there above the clock. Oh, I hope it's not too many steps. Ah, good. There's a lift. Pretty cool view. Iceland was one of the last places on Earth to be settled by humans when the Vikings arrived here in the 9th century. Look at the backdrop. You see the snow, the snowy mountains, the volcanoes. Because don't forget, the volcano that stopped all the air traffic years ago, this erupts regularly. Every four years on average, we are due for one. Before I head out, I need to get myself kitted up, Icelandic style. So I'm thinking mm, knitwear. I was checked here with itchy. I've got really sensitive skin. <laughs> yeah. Could be the one. Did they have this in small? Unfortunately not. So I've chosen this one. Very Icelandic. Now I'm not really here for the Icelandic fashion, so I'm heading just outside the city to visit some extraordinary baking that could only happen here. I've been driving for about five, ten minutes, and all of a sudden the terrain starts changing. It's quite imposing, it's quite wild. When most people think of Iceland, they think of this remote, rugged, cold, Oh, so beautiful. Look at it. It's a stunning landscape, but one that is difficult for growing grain. Barley was one of the few crops that could survive Iceland's poor soil and short growing season. It's perhaps why Iceland doesn't have a rich history of baking. In fact, there was no professional bakery here at all until the early 19th century. Gotta get yourself in, haven't you? 
I'm fascinated to find out how the Icelandic people have turned this volcanic landscape to their advantage. People in Iceland don't shy away from the volcano, they embrace it. I'm going to go and meet someone who's harnessed the power of the volcano. So what I'm going to take you to is a bakery that bakes like no other bakery I've ever been to in my life. I'm really looking forward to this. This is going to be very, very special. Nestled in the mountains just outside Reykjavik is the small town of Evrigadi, and it's the home to Baker Alma. Alma, how are you doing? You all right? Very good. Alma makes European-style breads, but also something uniquely Icelandic that I've never seen before. I'm a third generation of bakers here in this house, and we always made the geothermal bread 70 years. Geothermal ovens are different from these conventional ovens that I'm used to. In fact, I don't actually know what they are. And we always go outside to do it. Because Iceland is a volcanic landscape, it has places where the heat erupts near the surface as geysers and hot springs, known here as geothermal parks. For generations, the bakers have harnessed this heat and built their own unique ovens. So what? Inside this is the geothermal. So you've got it on a pipe that comes round and feeds these. Yeah. Over here is the geothermal park. Yeah. So you, from there, it then gets fed to here. Yeah. So you're effectively steaming your bread. Yeah, basically. Wow, OK. And steaming here for 18 hours is one of his special rye breads. Shall I take it inside? Yeah, absolutely. It's cost Almar nothing but time to finish this loaf. So what is this made from? We have rye flour, yeah. sour milk, yeah. water, sugar. Yeah. I've never seen anything like it in my life. <laughs> but that is incredible. Can I cut a little slice off to have a look? It's amazing. I mean, this is made by Mother Nature and Father Nature. <laughs> <laughs> it's just... The texture is a little bit like a cake. It's, it's like a sponge pudding. Yeah. It looks like a sponge pudding. Go? Let's have a quick look. It is the most amazing thing I've seen being baked using nature. Mm. Thank you. That's well, delicious. <laughs> now, all I want to do now is get stuck in myself. Can we make something together? Yeah, we can do that. Almar suggests we celebrate my visit by doing a bit of an experiment. He's been working on a recipe for a fruit loaf that uses Icelandic barley. This is going to be fascinating. First, we use the sour milk. Yeah. In there? Yeah. In with that sour milk goes the barley flour, the star of this bake. Thank you, Potter. OK. There's your rising agent going in. Is it big enough with all this? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> We're using rich fruit, dates and cranberries, then sugar. Do you have to use a lot of sugar when you're doing these geothermal stuff to get the colour? It's traditional. Oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Who am I going to argue with tradition? Orange syrup will give a bit of an extra zing. After a few minutes mixing, it's transferred into an unusual cooking pot, a reused plastic bucket. Yeah, that's lovely. Then I just put a lid on it and go to the geothermal pot. And we're going to bake this one right amongst the hot springs and geysers next door. This is exciting. This is the geothermal park, yeah. It's incredible. It's like being on a, an alien planet. Underneath here, we have active volcanoes underneath. Yeah. And this is what's heating the water and sending it up. Yeah. It's just incredible. This town was built around this area. Yeah, deliberately. Yeah, because it was cheap to heat up the house. Oh, something bubbling over yeah, there. Yeah, there's some bubbling there. It's, it's, cool it's, it's a small geyser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. OK, here we have that. Here's our oven. Yeah. Oh, I am here. The steam has a faintly sulphurous smell to it. It's not unpleasant. Can you just put it inside? It's about half a meter. See you, little fella. Yeah. This is outside cooking on another scale. Better come back tomorrow and... We'll check it out. Yeah. 
knowing that it's this that's going to cook the bread is incredible. The earth is alive, it's bubbling. Every inch of that water that runs through here, you can boil an egg in. You couldn't touch it, you scald yourself. Oh, it's died down now. It's just amazing. It's Mother Nature at its best. Our pot is going to be sitting in the volcanic steam for a good 18 hours. I'll be back tomorrow to taste it. Well, I've already seen some amazing baking, and I can't wait to see what else this city has to offer. Over the last 20 years, international baking has had a big effect on Reykjavik's baking, and nowhere more so than one of the most popular bakeries in town. This looks pretty good. Sandholt Bakery has been family-run since the 1920s, and the current baker is the multi-award-winning Askia Sandholt. Hello. Hello. Under his father, this place was a traditional Icelandic bakery, and Askia still makes the deep-fried sweet dough twists from that time, known as Kleiner. Do you remember these as a little boy? Yes, I remember this. My father still loves this a lot, and if I don't have it in the store... Does he show it? He shows up and makes it. <laughs> The family tradition is to serve them with skier, a yogurt which is peculiar to Iceland. Skier is extremely dry, so I mix it with a little bit of cream to make it a little bit more nice. We can just cream this. And for some sweetness, an Icelandic blueberry coolie. But you should try. Lovely. The blueberry, the cream, the yogurt, the Kleiner, together, it's a really nice rounded dish. Whilst the Kleiner belongs to his father's time, a skier's own baking has influences from much further abroad. This is a pumpkin whole wheat bread, sourdough, yep. and this one is made with 10% rye. And I'm buying it from two different companies in Italy. Yeah. And then uh, we sometimes get some experimental flour from Saudi Arabia and different places because we really wanted to find flowers which would interest us. Have a look at that. A great crumb, great structure, and a great flavour. I didn't expect to find such exotic flowers in Iceland. But croissants, of course, well, they're baked everywhere. But even these, the skier is rethinking. In Iceland, they make croissant by just taking the French bread dough. I really wanted to make a really nice, proper croissant. So I take the milk and the butter and the salt and the sugar. I melt it all together, and then I, put, I make a croissant syrup. He ferments this unusual syrup for three days, which gives an extra flavor to the final dough. He's so particular, he even has his own butter made for him. The fat quantity in the butter was 70% when I started. So I went into process with him, working with him, and I changed their butter into 81%. Nice color inside. Tastes good. So you're changing the French croissant into an Icelandic one. You're bettering the croissant. Yes. If a French tourist comes to Iceland and tastes my croissant, I want him to miss it when he goes back to France. <laughs> and then my goal is achieved. <laughs> this guy is bold. Who dares to be better than the French at croissants? I love seeing baking that's been thought through and is not stuck in a rut. That is the future of Icelandic baking right there. Coming up, wow. a hipster baker making sourdough like I've never seen before. I don't have a proper recipe for the bread. That's also the fun part. <laughs> and I make my Icelandic-inspired sponge cake. Now, what we've got is something which is unique. It looks good. I'm exploring the capital of Iceland, Reykjavik, and I'm beginning to realise how unique it is. I'm actually on my way to what's alleged to be one of the coolest bakeries in Reykjavik. And it's run by a guy called August. Looks pretty funky, doesn't it? On a Saturday morning, locals flock here for their fresh loaves. I've come a bit later to avoid the masses and to meet the man behind all the fuss. Hello, August. 
Lovely to meet you, August. August is one of the new wave of bakers in the city, and he's very much doing his own thing. How did you get into baking? Yeah, when I was a teenager, I needed to take an apprenticeship. And I knew at the bakery I got free donuts when I was off. I knew I would go home with something, so that's why I chose the bakery. <laughs> and then I moved to Denmark and finished my education there. Equipped with new skills, he came home to Reykjavik to bake. OK, I can only see three different types of bread. Is, that a, is there a reason for that? I mean, keep it simple. Can I see your products? Yeah, Let's have a look. Course. Let's have a look. This is a Danish flour called Öland. It's a very common thing in Denmark. Yeah. And uh, wow. we raise it only with sourdough mother. Yeah. And salt and wheat. That's it. I don't have a proper recipe for the bread. That's also the fun part. <laughs> yeah, so you go, you go by the so, feel. Yeah, and I put as much water as I like. It's got a lovely flavour. I can taste the zing from the sour, which is quite potent. The crust is fantastic. That is a great sourdough. That one is einkorn. Einkorn is one of the earliest wheats, first grown 5,000 years ago. That's got a much nuttier smell. Yeah. Much, much nuttier. It's crispy. Imagine that toaster in the morning with a bit, a bit of jam. Should you make that one? Absolutely, yeah. Should try? I'm intrigued by August's low-fuss approach. This is a Danish flour and uh, produced in Denmark in corn. Quite expensive. Extremely expensive. <laughs> uh, extremely good. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're operating in quite I, a small area, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, I like it. I'm lazy as well, so I don't <laughs> like to walk, walk too much. And, <laughs> and uh, here we have the sourdough mother. My recipe is quite simple. We put two and a half litres of sourdough each bag. He blends his expensive iron corn with regular flour to get the perfect mix. Yeah. Do you know what the protein level is? No, is no clue. Yeah, I'm going to clue. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and to be honest, I'm not, uh, I'm not a nerd. OK. And I don't know why some of the things happen that I'm yeah. doing, that it happens. It's just that one. If I do it like this, I get this. <laughs> I love it. I love the haphazard nature, yeah. but it just works. August's freestyling technique is really unusual. Baking is considered normally a precise art, but not in this bakery. So I start with 30 litres of water, and then I just add and add and add constantly. Yeah. After a long 24-hour prove, it's baked straight away. The dough is very wet and just sprinkled with pumpkin seeds and barley. Well, then we cut it like in half. Cut it, and then I... Just so it doesn't stick to the loader. Yeah. It's kind of tricky handling dough this wet. It's a bit, it's too big, it's too big, this. I normally have one about that big. Uh, it's, it's massive. It's easier to work with when you have it so big. There you go. See, that's the trick. He doesn't need or shape his dough, it's just stretched. And that's basically how we do all our bread. Like, we're not spending time on, on shaping, weighing and all that. Yeah. Yeah. But on the other hand, people get also different sizes of bread and they just accept it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should you load it? Yeah. And with that, it's baked. Well, Gus might not be baking by the classic methods, but it works for his customers. Earlier in my visit, I tried the Icelandic yogurt skier. It has been part of Iceland's diet since the 9th century, but recently I've seen it for sale back home in England. I'm intrigued to discover what it is, so to help me find it on the supermarket shelves here, I'm meeting local food author Ava Leifey. Welcome. Lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you here. And she's offered to show me how skier can be used in baking. The texture is a bit like yogurt, maybe thicker. Yeah. Well, it's the, one of the oldest dairy products we have in Iceland. This is like the plain original skir. Well, it is like a yogurt then, isn't it? It's like it's more sour than a yogurt. It's more thicker. Mm. Skir is said to be healthier than many similar yogurts. It's often almost fat-free, with higher protein and calcium levels. My grandma used to give this to me. She like she put sugar in it and cream, and we got it like every night. And my grandma used to eat it all the time. Mm. And now, these days, because our generation, they need more sugar and more fla flavor. Yeah. So 
these brands this with chocolates, baked apples, vanilla. So the, the, the kids tended to go for them. Nowadays, they tend yeah. to go with the more flavoured ones, well, but the older generation go for They go for, this. for the original ones. Have you got one? Yep. Well. That's not the only thing I would like you to try out. Right. Because the liquid, when they were doing this back in the days, the liquid that you drain out of the skier, yeah. called mesa, people used to drink that. Right. Don't know. Do not be afraid. <laughs> but people used to drink this, and they, they, they said it was like the healthiest drink you can get. Do Actually, we need that as well? Yeah, I'm gonna, we're going to taste it. Take a shot of it. Why not? Hmm, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be so excited. No, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> I've used yoghurt in baking for years, so how skier works in Ava's recipes back home, I can't wait to see. It's a bit windy, isn't it? Well, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> OK. It's Good not. Weather. I'll put my shorts on. Here we got that, like, vanilla, old-fashioned skier cake. Mm -hmm. Now this is a set cake, so you've got skier in there. Have you got icing sugar in there? Have icing you got sugar and a little bit of vanilla beans. Mm -hmm. It looks good. <laughs> I thought skier was going to be quite sour, but it's been sweetened beautifully. Mm -hmm. And actually the jam on the top, again, adds another layer of sweetness. So actually together, biscuit, the cheesecake, and then the topping. Yeah, that's a fantastic cheesecake. That's great. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And we'd like to try the skiramisu. Oh, go on then. Skiramisu. Skiramisu. Ava's replaced mascarpone yeah. with skier, so this should be a healthier, low-fat version of tiramisu. That's a nice tiramisu. Could you, like, feel the difference of using mascarpone cheese and skier? Can't notice the difference. Uh -huh. That's I like that. No, I like that. Yeah. Okay. Now, whether this miese tastes as good, I'm not sure. There you go. Cheers, of course. Cheers. <laughs> It's the liquid byproduct from making the skier. Oh, mm -hmm. that's sharp, isn't it? My granddad used to drink this all the time, and we were like, we would just smell it and ah, oh, disgusting. Yeah. But it's 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 better than I thought it would be because I haven't tasted it in many years. Right now okay. it's my turn yeah, to it it's my turn to bake skier. Mm -hmm. I've made yogurt cake before, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking skier could be in replacement of the yogurt to create. Quite a light sponge. My recipe uses skier as part of the sponge mixture, which should keep it really moist. And I've also got it layered inside with jam in place of cream. So what we've got, we've got the eggs. Mm -hmm. I'm going to crack them straight in. You're actually cheating me because I never use skier in this kind of baking. I use it in like fresh cakes, like just with the cream. So you're cheating me how to bake. I'm using vegetable oil, sugar and the star the low-fat skier. So give us a little bit of a whisk. Yeah. To the wet, add the dry. Plain flour, baking powder and ginger. I love baking because it reminds me of my family, my grandmother and my mother. The home was always filled with cake smell. When it's blended and smooth, fill two lined tins. I'm just going to relax it down to the corners. Why do you do that? It's just to equal it out, just level it out a little bit. This needs around 25 minutes to bake. Thank you very much. Go. And once cooled, it's ready for filling. Now, I'm going to put skier in the middle. I'm going to dollop it onto the cake. I'm really excited. I'm tasting it. <laughs> it looks good. Now, I've got this... Rhubarb jam. Rhubarb jam. Yeah, OK. So I'm just going to put a little drizzle of this on the top. Okay, so I'm just going to put some of this through the skier to get a nice blend. Then place the other sponge on top with a little dusting of icing sugar to finish. Oh, beautiful. Now, what we've got is something which is unique, something that Eve has not tried before, but I think you need to try a little slice. There it is, my delightful Icelandic-inspired skier sponge cake. I loved how you used the Icelandic ingredient skir and to make this big cake. I've never done it before and I can't wait to show my family and friends. Coming up, I head back to the geothermal part with Alma to taste our barley bread. It's really good. That's special, that. And I visit a restaurant serving Iceland's most traditional dishes. I mean, that looks hideous.
Iceland is turning out to be a land of firsts for me. I've left a bread baking in geothermal steam overnight. We're going to come back tomorrow and we'll check it out. Yeah. And discovered Skia, a healthy Icelandic yogurt. A short drive outside Reykjavik is somewhere I've been fascinated to see for years. It's the famous Blue Lagoon. Yeah, look at it, that's it over there. Look at the steam pouring off it. This is Iceland's biggest tourist attraction. Locals started bathing here in this man-made pool in the 1980s and soon found that the mineral-rich water helped calm many skin complaints. But no, I'm not going for a dip. Swimming pools have never really been my thing. What I love is this incredible landscape. There's something magical about being surrounded by what is basically <laughs> the middle of a lava flow. This is all the lava from an eruption. But if you look at this here, look at the colour of this water. Come here, look at this. That power station over there, they're pumping up the geothermal water from the ground. And it's really hot. I mean, it's boiling. You could boil an egg in it. It's cooled off during the rotors, and then it's pumped into these pits. And the one round the corner there is where the people bathe in. It's 40 degrees. It's like a hot tub. But it's so spooky. It's like being on another planet. It is really strange. Growing up in the Wirral, never thought I'd see places like this. I've never seen lava in almost its purest form, this big, bulky, aggressive black rock that it's quite imposing. And it's everywhere on Iceland. The whole island is like this. It's cool though, isn't it, yeah? Back in the city, I've come to meet a young guy who's keeping the cuisine of old Iceland alive in these modern times. In a converted salt factory, chef Steiner Svensson and owner Elmer Blackman have set up a restaurant. They have offered to cook up a couple of dishes for me, which they promise will be like nothing I've eaten before. This is where it all came from. This is where it came from. Their guiding principles were all recorded in the 1940s in this book by Helga Sierra Dottir. She's a legend, this lady. She traveled across the country, yeah. uh, talking with farmers, talking with housewives, talking with Icelandic people, finding old recipes, and she put it all down for us. She's the godmother? Yeah. She's the godmother <laughs> of Icelandic yeah. cuisine. Yeah. Our main focus is the Icelandic population. Yeah. We, we want to make them and make them feel proud of their Icelandic food tradition and discover it again. Sounds great. I'm hungry. Bring it on. So, Paul, this is the cod's head. I did not expect this. Doesn't it look a bit scary and a little bit colourless? This is a long way from fish fingers. It's the same fish, Icelandic cod, but the recipe glazes it with seaweed and chicken stock. I mean, that looks hideous. Yeah, it does. While the head gets a good roasting, they have another recipe for me. You've done plenty of uh, meringues in your life, right? Yeah. So let's uh, try something different. I have a uh, lamb's uh, blood. Right. So we're going to do a uh, blood uh, meringue. Delicious. <laughs> but we're going to spice it up uh, a little bit with uh, thyme and uh, some uh, bilberries. Blood meringue? Yeah. Yeah, go on. OK, let's go. There are no egg whites in sight. OK, blood. Just a pint of fresh lamb's blood. Sugar? A little bit of sugar and the special uh, herbs. I can't believe that a blend of blood, sugar and herbs could possibly be a meringue. But once baked and served very prettily with skier yoghurt and berries, it looks quite presentable. Dig in. OK. I mean, you can taste the iron. Actually, it tastes like a meringue. Yeah, exactly. It tastes like a sweet meringue. You wouldn't notice blood in there. The blood meringue is delicious. I can't believe I'm saying that. The cod's head has now had a good 40 minutes roasting. Voila. <laughs> now that looks 10 tons better than it did before. As it's roasted gently, the glaze needs a blast of heat. So you're caramelizing it Yes. Now. 
before it's ready for feasting on. It's beautiful. You just dig in. Best parts, oh, but uh, of course there's a lot of meat on top here and underneath the ice. It tastes nothing like how it looks. It's beautiful, it's barbecue flavour. It's cod, which is meaty. It melts in the mouth. I am really shocked, and I, it's not very often I'm lost for words. Clearly, the Icelanders in history were frugal and had to use everything. But as the recipes prove, they understood good flavours. What you just introduced me to is um, this young lady's food, and you kept it alive. So it's a good shock. Absolutely. <laughs> that food is unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you. Yesterday, I visited a baker who bakes using the natural geothermal heat coming from the ground around his bakery. We experimented with making a fruit loaf using Icelandic barley flour, and this evening, I'm returning to bring the loaf out of the ground. This is going to be curious, my first geothermal baking experience. Alma, hey, how are you? Nice to see you again, you're nice. How are you? How's the bread? Do you think it's good? Yeah, we see. All right. <laughs> so have a look at it. Somewhere in all this sulfurous steam is our experimental bake. All right, let's have a look. Uh, yeah, there it is. All right, let's give this a go, shall yeah. we? With his bakery closed for the day, we're going to test the loaf in the community greenhouse, which, because of all the free heat from the ground, is able to support Icelandic banana plants and grapes. This country's nuts. <laughs> what I'm smelling, Almar, is a Christmas pudding. Thank Just you. pop it on. Wow. I've got to cut into this. Oh, it's roasting. Look at that. Grab yourself a piece. Oh, thank you. It's really good. That's special, that. Good experiment. Yes. It isn't like Almar's usual rye bread. The barley and dried fruit are blended together to create a perfect, slowly steamed pudding. You've got a slight back note of barley in there. It's fruitier, much more fruitier. Mm, yeah. It's sweeter, do you think it's yeah, sweeter as well? That's the fun of me, because there's less sugar in this bread. Mm -hmm. I think it's the fruit that's carrying the sugar, so it's better for you, and it costs nothing to bake it. And we're also using Icelandic barley. Yes, you are. Yeah. It created something that's unique, but it's been baked by the earth itself. It's very special. I'll remember that bake. Okay. The first time I've been a part of baking something that's using a volcano's heat to heat the water to cook the pudding. I need to take this back to the UK, if you don't mind, Omar. Yeah, you're welcome. This is a volcanic Christmas cake. That is fantastic. Thank you very much, Omar. Much appreciated. You're a hero. Thank you. Leaving the warmth of the greenhouse makes the Icelandic nights seem colder. The temperature has dropped in the last hour or two. I know it's gone dark, but this has been one of the colder nights. There is a slim chance that if I'm lucky, tonight I may get to see those magical shapes that dance across the sky, the northern lights. Now, you grew up with the, the northern lights. Yeah, I've seen it is a million it, times. Is it something you just go, Phew. northern lights? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I think we Icelanders, we stopped looking at them, but in the recent year we are starting to look up again because the tourists are telling us how beautiful it is. Yeah. And we are just, okay. I'd love to see them, you know. Good luck for that. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. See you again. My drive back to the city might give me that chance. This is the snowy plateau just before Reykjavik, before it drops down into Reykjavik. And I did see some stars before, and I'm hoping that there might be a little few breaks in it to see if we can see the Northern Lights. 
what's really weird is sometimes you get like a slight red hue. Maybe it's my eyes just playing tricks on me because I want to see it so badly. I've got the clear skies, but it's solar activity from the sun that causes the lights. Been here about half an hour now. The moon's come out, look at that. How pretty is that against the snow-capped mountains there? And we have got a huge, almost horizon to horizon clear sky. You can see all the stars. Come on. Little one, little flare. Any there. As you can probably see, it's beginning to rain and snow now. And what little light we did have, the wind is so strong, it's just blowing it, it's just blowing all that clear sky away. So, no northern lights tonight. Coming up, I discover a bread that's as delicate as a winter snowflake. Oh, wow, should have brought me glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be baking Reykjavik's delicious layered Wiener Turtle cake. Word seems to have got around that I'm exploring the baking of Reykjavik, and the city's mayor, Dago Eggertsen, has invited me round to his family home for a bit of seasonal baking. Hello, Dower. Hi. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Oh, hello, thank Please you. Please come in. Dagger has offered to show me a traditional bread that gets made once a year before Christmas. Hello, oh, this nice is my wife. Hello. Hello. Nice hello. Nice hello. Nice this is Eggert. Yes. Heida. Uh, Steiner. And moa. So what is all this then? So this is leaf bread. This seems more like a craft session than a bake-up. This leaf bread is made of paper-thin dough that Arna has pre-bought. And everyone is cutting the most intricate patterns into them. So you want to cut them, then you deep fry them. I'd be interested to see how they react in the fryer to see what type of dough it is, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious to have a go myself, actually. This ancient tradition comes from a time where wheat was imported and expensive. What they had was rolled very thin so the whole family could have a piece for Christmas, with the cutting tools handed down the generations. Oh, I see. That's a great little thing, that, isn't it? It is. And the conventional thing is then to take every second one and kind of fold it. So it's oh, almost see. like the... It's like lattice. Nice. Icelandic sweater, kind of. Yeah. I'm glad I dress for the occasion. This tradition brings everyone together. Even the mayor finds time. You look quite young to be a mayor. You're the youngest mayor I've ever met. Is it an uh, old man sport? <laughs> In the UK, yeah. <laughs> uh, Reykjavik is, I mean, cities in general, actually, are very interesting things. Mm. And they are growing and... They are creating jobs and quality of life, or failing at it. Yeah. And uh, so it's a real privilege to to have this job, actually. Reykjavik is one of those real curiosities that you hear so much about I Iceland. But actually, when you come here and do a bit of digging, it's such an amazing, eclectic place. Well, and the actually, passion, the passion yeah. of the people mm. is very strong. It's very nice. and and. Uh, maybe that's kind of an island mentality. Uh, we know that we are not many, mm. uh, and we know that kind of uh, interesting things come out of mixing things together that come from different places. Yeah. And so we very much cherish that people go abroad, but we really want them to come back, come back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, bring with them influences from all over the world. Wow, should have brought me glasses. <laughs> <laughs> should we try this one? Yes. Wow, that's active. It's like a prawn cracker. That's incredible. The dough is a mix of wheat flour, sugar, salt, milk, butter, and baking powder. It reacts a little bit like uh, a puff pastry. It puffs up slightly initially, so all those, all those little cuts. 
just open up. You see my sad attempt. So you can see them all open up, and you can see where the fryer's just scorched. It's a little bit hot, but interesting pattern. It smells like a donut. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the snowflakes that kids cut out of paper. Utterly charming. Who did that one? This is uh, Heda. That's a good one, that one. It's nice. Whoa. That's a monster, that one, isn't it? It's good, though. I think when you stop sizzling, it's telling you when it's ready. It's like you were born and raised in the north. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm from Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> And to serve them, mm. just spread with Icelandic butter and crunch. It's not like a pancake. It's like a bread, but with the texture of a cracker. That's what it's like. It's like a cracker. It's a cracker with butter on it. They're delicious. They are. Really nice, yeah. At the end of my journey, this is a reminder of Iceland's tough and frugal history, a time before the richness of international baking arrived. Honestly, they're really good. <laughs> and it's great to see Dango's kids having such quiet fun making them. I know you're a busy man. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. What a brilliant family. I'm going to have to try that when I get home. I've had a hectic but memorable time in Iceland. But before I leave, Askia's team at Sandholt Bakery have kindly let me come back and borrow a workbench. I'm going to bake something that's caught my eye in a few of the bakeries I've visited. Now, what I'm going to make is Vina Teta. Now, let me show you this. These are a few of the examples that you get in Reykjavik. So this one is made with buttercream, this one is made with jam, and this one is made with prune. What it is is a layered cake or a layered biscuit, and this has almost become their national dish. Now, the one I'm going to use to make is basically oats, so I'm going to make it an oatmeal biscuit, and I'm going to sandwich in between chocolate buttercream. It's very simple to make. So, to start with, I'm going to cream the butter and the sugar together. It shouldn't take very long at all. It just goes slightly paler yellow. When it's fluffy, pour in the beaten eggs and some vanilla. And then I'm going to add the flour, the baking powder, a little bit at a time to this mixture. And then we've got oatmeal. Again, the reason why I'm using this, it's Icelandic. Barley and oats were grown in this country, so I'm trying to keep it as close to Iceland as possible. Blend the oats through the rest of the ingredients. I'm happy with that. I'm just going to put a little bit of flour on here. And bring them together on the bench for a moment. Now I need to get the dough ready for rolling out those layers. This is going to go in the fridge to chill down for a little bit. It just helps you roll it out. While it chills, get the filling ready. You could use jam or a fruit compote, but I'm using icing sugar, butter and melted chocolate beaten into a smooth paste. There it is. That's the buttercream done. Slightly stiffened from the fridge, the dough should now be easier to roll out. Take your time doing this, don't rush it. Now, this is the thing I'm using to cut. So, we are going to get through. I'm sure Iceland's grandmothers never wasted a crumb, so neither will I. You should have just enough to roll out a fourth layer. Just dock it all the way down, just to prevent them from rising up too much. Then pop your biscuit layers in the oven for 15 to 20 minutes, and they should be golden brown. OK, there are our baked layers. Build it up using a third of the filling each time. Don't worry about going right to the end, because what's going to happen, we're going to trim this down anyway. So you see the biscuit, you see the buttercream. Another layer on top, and repeat.
Last layer on top. Traditionally, vena turta is left for a day or so before trimming as the biscuit will soften a little. But I'm just getting away with doing it now. Don't waste the trimmings. They're a great baker's peck. A little bit of icing sugar on the top. I think you'd be good to go. There you have it, vena turta, straight from Iceland. Reykjavik has been one city baked destination that I've found full of surprises. I expected it to be snowy, and yes, found snow up on the plateau. I didn't expect it to be this wet. I thought the Icelandic people wouldn't be as friendly. I was wrong. I think they are very, very friendly people. The way that humans have adapted to this island, and the fact that it's so barren, so remote, is incredible. Icelandic people have had to travel back to mainland Europe to learn new skills and actually bring them back to Iceland and make it their own. That's what they've been doing on the bread front and the cake front. I think Iceland is a fascinating place. Yes, I've fallen in love with Reykjavik, the city. <laughs>